Uh, it is my great pleasure to begin the awards presentation with the uh, Edwin G. Conklin Medal. This medal was established in 1995 by the Society. Uh, it is awarded annually to recognize a developmental biologist who has made and is continuing to make extraordinary research contributions to the field and is an excellent mentor who has helped train the next generation of outstanding scientists. This year's award recipient is Magdalena Zernica Gertz. Magdalena was born in Warsaw, Poland and carried out her studies at the University of Warsaw uh, with Andras Tarkowski studying mouse embryo chimeras. She did her postdoctoral work at the University of Cambridge with Martin Evans and John Gurdon, two names that I think everyone in this room recognizes as pioneers in stem cell biology and cloning and of course Nobel laureates. She started her own independent group at Cambridge, supported by generous support from the Wellcome Trust, and she became a professor in development and stem cell biology at the University of Cambridge, but then decided that the uh, climate and the, uh, the beauty of California lured her to go to Caltech as the Bren Professor of Biology and, Bio and Biological Engineering. Magda has established a novel and inventive research program studying cell fate decisions in cultured human embryos. Her group has combined three different stem cell types to create a more holistic in vitro representation of the human embryo. And these embryos provide op an opportunity to dissect the genetic and extracellular signaling events that underlie development and early organogenesis in, directly in human embryos. In addition to her outstanding and cutting edge work, um, she's committed to promoting equality in science and supporting the careers of diverse trainees through her mentorship and her participation in nonprofit charities. Magda is a vibrant and creative person. I've gotten to know her over the years. And so without further ado, I will turn the podium over to our 2022 Edwin G. Conklin awardee, Magdalena Zernica Gertz. Studying embryos to study stem cells and then use the stem cells to understand how embryos are bleached together. But it is really the work of uh, incredible students and postdoc that I have a pleasure to have with me in the lab in Cambridge and now in the lab of, at Caltech that I will be talking about. So I would be really reflecting in their light. And I wish this medal is not just for me, it is really for the lab. And, and I'm so grateful for it. You can't believe how honored I feel uh, receiving this medal. And the reason is that uh, I not only have a very deep respect to all of the previous recipients, but also many of, of them I consider as my very close friends, scientific friends and private friends. So this is an honor. And the second honor is that Conklin is uh, one of the founders of experimental embryology. He was asking the question, how do cells become different? from each other, and he was studying this beautiful Siona embryo that you are seeing here. And we are addressing exactly the same question, but in mammalian embryos. And for years, we were struggling to understand when and how cells become different, trying to identify their first guide uh, that will let us know when they establish their fate. I would like to show you just one slide from my past, uh, just to say that my scientific fate begins in Warsaw, Poland which at the time was a communist country behind a curtain, iron curtain, so we didn't travel a lot for a very long time. And everything really appeared in a different shades of gray. The colors were really suppressed, sort of hidden in our hearts. And I still remember that image of Poland very well. But through the complex um, lineage of self-aid decisions, I set up my lab in a colorful Cambridge and more recently in Sunny Caltech. So this really shows that everything is possible. So I would like to start uh, with the major question that we are trying to address in the lab. And this is uh, how every single creature from the mouse to the human being that you can see on this slide is so unique and spectacular, has its own form, but also own emotion habits. And yet the life of every single creature starts in exactly the same way. 
So we are trying to understand these major principles that make uh, cells that will build our life uh, unique from each other and collaborating with each other. So for many years, uh, we have been trying to understand the major principles of so-called pre-implantation development in mouse and human uh, to understand how the first three tissues become established. Through tracking cells, we found that the first major principle is to set up heterogeneity between the cells, that initially it's not deterministic, it's just guiding cell fate specification. The second major step is polarization of the embryo at the eight cell stage, and after the series of symmetric and asymmetric divisions, the cells progressively, in again not deterministic fashion, but progressively are uh, establishing their future fate. So these red cells on the slide are the ones that will form the epiblast, so every single cell that will, uh, will build our body will come from that red lineage. The green cells are called primitive endoderm, and this will form the yolk sac in which embryo will grow. And finally, the blue cells are very important because they would be forming trophectoderm that will allow the development of the embryo within the body of the mother. Another major principle that happens in development is to uh, set up these lineages on time. And more recently, we are trying to understand how uh, the time, uh, the, the, where is this developmental clock coming from? We know that, for example, polarization of cells always happen at the eight cell stage, but actually, embryos do not count the number of the divisions to initiate polarization. And we found that this is the accumulation of these two transcription factors, epi 2 gamma and TET4, that have to come to certain threshold to work together with rho A to establish the stunning apical cap domain at the eight cell stage. So a lot of work from our lab and many other labs um, made such a great uh, picture of the pre-implantation mouse embryo in which we can really understand now many processes as they happen because embryos can be cultured in vitro. But what happens next have been a developmental black box. And this is because mouse embryo, so when we wish to find out how these lineages uh, talk to each other, we have to always in the past, and, and I was one of those people going back with those embryos to mother, for example, labeling individual cells at the blastocyst stage, put embryos back to the mother and then recover it a few days later to understand the patterns of cell behavior, so to look at the distribution of clones. This was never very satisfactory because we will never be able to look at the dynamic picture. So really to address the question of how the lineages um, talk to each other for embryo to start to grow for the very first time in mouse and even more so in human embryos that will never be possible to study at the time of implantation. Uh, we uh, invested uh, many years in developing the system of, culture, of culturing mouse and human embryos through the implantation stages in vitro. So here I'm showing you one of our first embryos going through this transition. In this particular study we were trying to understand where this anterior signaling center, anterior organizer, or AV, that I will talk quite a lot today about, is coming from uh, trying to understand the origin of that center. Setting up that system was really a team effort, so many people in my lab were involved, but I would like to acknowledge specifically the first uh, authors of the first two iconic paper for us, from our point of view, for setting up that system. So this is Sam Morris who was the postdoc in the lab and now uh, has uh, her own group in Warsaw and in St. Louis, and Ivan Betzov, who now has his own group uh, at Minster in Germany in Max Planck Institute. So luckily for us, exactly the same uh, culture method allow us to look at the development of the human embryo from pre to post implantation stages, so for the very first time, we can uh, film how lineages uh, interact with each other, and there are many papers now coming out, uh, f not only from our lab, but from many labs that try to understand how embryos develop at the time. So um, the paper that I'm showing here is showing the establishment of the same anterior signaling center here in the hypoblast. So this is really equivalent of that center that uh, first was discovered by Rosa Beddington in the mouse embryo. So we have this new culture system, so this allows us to propose new model for peri-implantation development. And we see that the first event that happens at the time of implantation 
is polarization of this group of epiblast cells, formation of this three-dimensional rosette-like structure in the center of which lumen will open. And using this system allow us to now, um, you know, sort of evolve our picture of what happens during this time of implantation morphogenesis to mouse embryos. So we can now look not only on the, uh, what happens to the epiblast, but how he, epiblast talks chemically and mechanically uh, with extra embryonic tissues for those uh, tissues to be remodeled in synchrony. So we can study mouse and human embryos at the time, but I wish to stress that actually studying mouse and even more so human embryos at the time is not easy. So several years ago, I thought that it would be incredible if we can develop models, so not real embryos, but we can develop or build stem cell models that will uh, allow us to understand the molecular mechanisms of these transitions that happen at the time of implantation. So in other words, can we use stem cells to understand how our embryos generate order from this initial chaos? And this is not possible because uh, the stem cells for these three tissues that are involved, so only three tissues are involved at the beginning of our life, are now established. So ES cells are stem cells for epiblast, TS cells are stem cells for trophoectoderm, and Zen cells are stem cells for this primitive endoderm lineage uh, that will make a yolk sac. So what I would like to uh, do in the next 15 minutes is to tell you about four models that we built uh, that are more and more complex successively to really understand the process of self-organization from the bottom up. Okay, I, I wish to say that here I would like to bond with Conklin one more time because he was saying that life is not found in atoms or molecules or genes as such, but in the organization, so not in symbiosis but in synthesis. So the first synthesis that we have done is just between, between cells um, that are alike. So we took few individual cells, embryonic stem cells, and embedded them in the matrigel, so this is extracellular matrix, and we saw that after 48 hours they are able to recapitulate those transitions that happen at the time of implantation. So this is a very simple system, we call it ES embryoids, so uh, what can we learn by using that system on its own, so without the adding uh, of extra embryonic tissues. So we are able to, uh, we are able to uh, uncover the steps of epiblast morphogenesis and see how it is coordinated with the cell identity and embryo size. So here I would like to acknowledge another postdoc in the lab um, that now has her own uh, group at LMB in Cambridge, Marta Shabasi. So what Marta did when she came to my lab a few years ago, she decided to block embryos uh, and embryoids in different phase of their sulfate transition. So in this case, she blocked them in naive state and showed that transition from naive to prime is not necessary for polarization and formation of this three-dimensional rosette-like structure, but is absolutely essential for that rosette to open the cavity. By identifying all genes that are expressed at different stages of this morphogenesis, uh, she was able uh, to, and, and changing their uh, pattern of gene expression, she was able to show that OCT4 uh, works together with OTX2 that become expressed upon exit from naive state to induce expression of podocalaxin, and this is really what is essential for lumen formation. Interestingly, uh, subsequently working with the PhD student de la Pro Lorenzo, we found that the mechanism of lumen formation depends on the number of cells that embryo has, so size matters. So when Lorenzo created double size embryos by putting few embryos together to create chimeras or making those clump of cells of different sizes, we realized that it is not then luminogenesis through uh, the constriction and opening up of the apic, uh, this, uh, cavity in the si inside the center that uh, is directing pramniotic cavity formation, but rather that is apoptosis. So there is a programmed cell death of cells in the center of that clump. So you see, uh, just from these two examples, that we are able to mimic early stages of embryogenesis by having just ES cells, individual ES cells, talking to each other in culture when they are surrounded by extracellular matrix. 
But we would like to go further and now see whether this embryo, this very primitive uh, embryonic model, can be developed into the more complex one that it will initiate uh, the symmetry breaking event uh, to establish anterior posterior axes. So to be able to do that, we know that in real life, this is the role of the extra embryonic tissues that are two shown here, that really are very critical for symmetry breaking event. So here the red tissue is the epiblast, and blue tissue is the primitive, uh, is extra embryonic ectoderm derived from trophoectoderm, and green tissue is visceral endoderm derived from the primitive endoderm. And this is here this anterior visceral endoderm signaling center that become established on the distal tip of the embryo that uh, Don Juan from my lab just was talking about a couple of uh, hours ago that migrates towards one side. And this is protecting this region of the epiblast to which it migrates uh, from posteriorizing signals. So AVE secretes inhibitors for nodal wind and BMP, such as Cerberus, Lefty, DKK, while the blue tissue, extra embryonic ectoderm, is secreting BMP4. So when these three signaling converge and are present at the highest, this is where the primitive streak forms. So this is really, uh, epiblast is sort of naive tissue, even in a prime state of its pluripotency. It is really this extra embryonic uh, tissues that will lead to the symmetry breaking event. So this knowledge of embryogenesis, uh, let us see whether we can um, provide stem cells for those two extra embryonic tissues and maybe one by one to really understand the role of the signaling that is provided to the epiblast for symmetry breaking events. So in the first model, uh, Sarah, a PhD student in the lab at the time, combined ESLs, TSLs together in extracellular matrix and created these ET embryos or ET embryoids that you can see look extremely similar to natural embryos. So really incredible, um, good looking structures. They form proamniotic cavity. But of course, they are missing this external layer of cells, visceral endoderm, that I've told you is essential for symmetry breaking event. This is the layer of cells that will form this anterior signaling center. So what did we learn through this model? So we learn to which extent we need that anterior signaling center for the symmetry breaking to occur. So I didn't predict that outcome, but when Sarah built embryos uh, using ESLs that uh, monitor uh, for expression of mesoderm marker, brachiuri. Uh, so they express GFP from brachiuri promoter. So with time, you will see that these embryos will break symmetry and will initiate mesoderm formation on one side of the embryo, close to the boundary with extra embryonic structures. So this was extremely interesting, and uh, this sort of expound our view of what happens at the stage of development, potentially also in natural embryo. So uh, initially we have this organizer guided linear cascade of signaling events that we all know exist at the time, but it seems that it can be replaced by the self-organizing uh, um, potential of the embryo in which uh, signaling interactions form networks allowing patterns to emerge really spontaneously. So it's a little bit like Alan Turing model. And I actually think that embryo perhaps is using both mechanisms. So then we took the cells from that posterior aspect of the embryo to check whether they actually express posterior genes or maybe they express only uh, brachiuri. And we found that they correspond to seven day old real embryo and uh, very well defined posterior signature is in present in them. But when we took cells from the opposite end of this axis, they were much less well defined. So maybe this is the role of anterior signaling center to establish this anterior signature there. So to be able to address that, we change our model and now we combine all three types of cells, all three types of stem cells, something that never worked before. So we put together ESLs, TSLs and Zen cells and we assemble embryos from all three components. So uh, the, the, the design is very different. We use this uh, geometric constraint dish, and this has been work uh, carried out in the lab uh, by Gianluca, who is still with me, although um, setting up next, next month his own lab uh, at Padua University in Italy, he's Italian, and Berna Sozen, who started her lab last year uh, at Yale. So when you look at those structures, you see that there are actually <laughs> many cases that are indistinguishable from natural embryos. 
So here on the left are, are synthetic embryos, on the right are real ones. But not all of them look like that, so the process is not 100% efficient. And this lack of efficiency allows us now to understand what are the real key things, mechanisms that have, we, we have to fulfill for the embryo to be perfect. So this is the efficiency, so when we put three types of cells together, majority of them, majority of the structures, nearly 70%, will contain all three types of cells but only 29% will have those uh, structures looking perfect. I mean, meaning all three compartments are well set up. So how does self-organization work and can we improve it? So now we can follow this process in movies, we can change in expression patterns and ask the question what it is that we really need to provide to these stem cells to make a perfect embryos. And we see that self-organization depends on two factors, so this is really cutting, long story short, cell adhesion and cortical tension. So mean in our lab at Caltech uh, starts to uh, being inspired by, uh, by studies in zebrafish embryos, and, and uh, Sean talked about it a couple of days ago, where they, it was uncovered that uh, adhesive code is very important for cells to talk to each other and organize themselves. We started to look at adhesion code also in, in, in that context. So what we uh, found that ecadherin is what is expressed in ES cells and in epiblast. TS cells and extraembryonic ectoderm express not only E cadherin but also P cadherin. And Zen cells express, in addition to E cadherin, express uh, K cadherin. And actually, what is extremely important to realize that when we culture those stem cells in vitro in two dimensions, there is enormous heterogeneity in the level of expression of these cadherins. And this is really what leads to the problems with the building process. So when you have the cells that do not uh, uh, recognize each other well through this cadherin code, they would be the cells that will be localized in uh, wrong compartments. So what we can do right now is we can regulate expression of cadherin uh, we can overexpress e in ES cells, p in T cells, and uh, generate this well-structured embryos. And indeed, it dramatically, it really dramatically increases the, uh, the level of formation of, of beautiful structures when we play just with cadherins. So the same is true um, for Zen cells. So actually, Zen cells and ES cell sorting remind us of sorting of epiblast cells and primitive endoderm cells in natural embryo. So now, again, if we down or upregulate expression of different cadherins present in Zen cells, either E or uh, K cadherins, we see that we can uh, change the efficiency of the structure formation. So uh, I would like to finish this with that um, model by saying that this differential cadherin code is very important for cell sorting in natural embryos and the synthetic embryos that we are making. I didn't have a time to show you today, but Cortical tension, particularly for Zen cells, is also very important. So this is mediated by GATA4, and when we overexpress GATA4 in ES cells, they would always externalize and go outside. So here, those cells have to change their tension, have to become softer to go outside. And as this fluid-like status in which cells move a lot is accomplished, then the solid-like status become established when the boundaries between compartments become very stiff and uh, cells decrease mobility and increase the tension to be able to maintain those compartments. Okay, so the next question is how actually far those structures develop? Can they really gastrulate? So that's really the critical question in the field. And when you think about it, they should because they have all of the compartments, but it's true that they, I didn't show you any data uh, to, to provide evidence for it. So I think that this is just one example of the structure that is gastrulating. And you can see here that those uh, ETX embryos develop apical domain, it's developed, sorry, uh, anterior visceral endoderm domain that migrates towards one side, and on the opposite side, they take epithelial to mesenchymal transition and initiate the process of gastrulation. So this is extremely exciting because these are the first model, to my knowledge, that actually 
undertake proper gastrulation, uh, first stem cell model, uh, through gastrulation, through EMT, through gastrulation movements. But they do not gastrulate properly. So they initiate the process, they embryo form mesoentoderm layer, but then the embryo becomes stuck. So really this uh, realization that we cannot execute gastrulation properly made us realize that we actually don't know exactly what it is that we need in mouse embryos for them to gastrulate properly. So I wish to show you how we went back from studying synthetic embryo-like structures to studying real embryos to really understand what's going on. And this has been work of a uh, postdoc in the lab, Nio, who is now setting up his lab in Cyprus, Nio is from Cyprus, and Christos, a PhD student who is now doing his postdoc at Harvard. So what did they do? Actually, it was not by design study. This was really by chance discovery. They were trying to understand how extra embryonic compartments in the embryo become remodeled. And by looking at embryos and staining for laminin, they found out that this laminin that is surrounding embryonic part of the embryo is full of perforations. That again, Don Juan was mentioning today, so I'm not going to go there in any detail. They were able then to correlate the distribution of these perforations that changes as development progresses with the migration of the anterior visceral endodem domain. So then they found that nodal is absolutely essential for those perforations to arise. So if we take nodal knockout embryos, perforations do not form. And this is because nodal regulates expression of two specific MMPs that are localized then to the future posterior of the embryo where the primitive streak will form. So what's the connection with the gastrulation? Well, the special localized perforations behave like if paving the way for ordal cert ingression. So it's run in a stocking model that we took from Donald Engberg, who, um, Engberg, who was explaining through that model how epiblasts become uh, remodeled um, in, the, in the lung. We think that this model applies also here. So this weakened basal membrane is breached in response to the force that is imposed on it uh, by proliferating mesoderm. And indeed, if we block MMPs, so if we use inhibitors to block MMPs for embryo culture in vitro, mesoendoderm does form, but it cannot move through. Uh, the embryo cannot gastrulate. So, essentially, the very last story that I will tell you is not published, and this will be just a few slides because my time is nearly coming to the end, in which we use that knowledge from natural embryogenesis to fix our ETX embryos. So this is model number four, uh, so-called induce uh, ETX embryos, in which we replace then cells that we found out are much more differentiated type of stem, of stem cells uh, than we wanted to have to mimic primitive endoderm. By, so we replace them by inducing GATA4 expression in ES cells. We know now that it is enough to change the softness of the swell cells to externalize and to drive expression uh, of other factors important for primitive endoderm program. So those structures form um, beautiful. They have all of the compartments. They uh, specify anterior signaling center that migrates. And on the opposite end, they undertake uh, EMT uh, and uh, execute gastrulation fully. So how far can they go? Well, they can go in culture uh, until they, we can culture them until they age when they correspond to 8.5 day old embryos. So I will remind you that are, that's, they are mouse embryos uh, that we are talking here about. So this ETX uh, develop heart, uh, develop head, develop somites. Essentially, they develop all different lineages that are present in normal embryos at that stage of development. And this is work, continuing work uh, of Jan and uh, PhD student in the lab, Charlotte. So uh, when you look at the pattern of gene expression, you see all of the lineages, and you see that they are, sorry, I'm skipping. You see that all different type of cells develop with the very similar proportion and timing in natural and uh, these embryoids. For each cell population, there is extremely strong correlation between natural and synthetic content part. And I would like to show you just a few examples at the very end. So here uh, is uh, immunostaining for the head markers. So you'll be able to see that all brain regions, including the most anterior part of the form brain, develop in the system. 
So this is incredible uh, that, that we finally had this region uh, in the uh, synthetic model system established. And when you look at the pattern of gene expression, you see that it corresponds to sort of 8.5875 day old natural embryo. Uh, when you look at the patterning of the neural tube, you see that it forms and closes. And you can see neural crest migrating cells here by SOX10 uh, uh, expression. That makes Marianne, my dear friend at Caltech, very happy that we can look at the system now to follow those cells. They develop heart that beats, and uh, this is incredible. I'm not showing you the movie, but you can see from the static picture that ha it has all of three, uh, sorry, all four chambers. And they establish somites as natural embryos. They establish primordial gem cells in the right location uh, at different stages of development. So we look here at the expression of Stella, SOX2, and Nanoc uh, uh, to identify those cells. And critically, as a unique stem cell model, they develop in a yolk sac because we provided this um, GATA4 overexpressing key cells to mimic primitive endoderm formation. So they develop in the sac as natural embryos will develop at this stage of development. And you start to see the formation of the blood islands in, in that yolk sac. So this is where we are with our uh, mouse embryo synthetic model system. So I wish to stress that this is really only by culturing embryos from pre to post implantation stages and identifying the principles that have to be fulfilled in real embryos that allow us to build uh, the synthetic embryo-like structures. So what I show you today is that, uh, uh, that we are able to use them to understand the mechanism of morphogenesis and its coordination with cell uh, fate transition and with the embryo size. Uh, we showed through that system that induction of gastrulation can happen without anterior signaling center, but this center is absolutely essential for the embryo to develop most anterior parts of the structures. And this is why it, it works so successfully that we can have this neurolating embryoids because we provide all components, all signaling components that embryo require at the time. And we do not substitute any of this with the chemical um, factors that we add to the media. So, of course, next question is how far can we go? And this is what we are working on. I think that we are limited right now at 8.5 day of development by the lack of in vitro culture system that would allow us to culture further such big embryos. And also, can we do something similar for human embryos? And I ran out of time, so I would not have time to talk about it. And I so much hope that you uh, visited uh, Bailey's poster. Uh, so Bailey uh, show our uh, progression with human embryo stem cell model. This is the work of Bailey and Carlos in the lab in Cambridge. They created very similar design by uh, forming three different lineages by overexpression of transcription factors that are critical for formation of the human hypoblast and human trophectoderm and then putting the cells together to form the structure that form all lineages. And when you look at the development of the structures and uh, monitor um, formation of this anterior signaling center, you see that it become established there exactly as we show in my, one, of the, my, one of my first slides in the human embryo. And on day eight, we start to express brachiuri domain uh, far away from that center, initiating process that mimics gastrulation. Whether this is true gastrulation, we don't know yet. So, my final slide is perhaps the most important one, at least in my heart, it is the most important slide. To one more time, thank every single person in my group for being incredible team, and it's really the medal is for them. Uh, I would like to thank our incredible collaborators and all our ex-lab member that I try to call by name, that's why it took me a little bit longer today. I wanted to tell you not only their past, but also their fate as it is right now. I would like to thank all uh, funding bodies and mention that we are now setting up the new adventure at Caltech. After 20 years in Cambridge, I've made this huge step in my life. So if you would like to join us at Caltech, please talk to me or write to me. So last but not least, thank you so much for attention and thank you so much for medal. <laughs>